Next, uh, we have uh, Paul Brereton uh, from Ferra, uh, mm -hmm. who's been taking back to the table. Okay, um, so first of all, briefly talk about food authenticity, what's the problem? Uh, I'm going to talk about how do we, this concept of verification, which uh, might not be immediately apparent. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the Food Integrity Project. And just to make sure you're still interested, especially the researchers among you, uh, um, there is 3 million euros up for grabs that we're going to talk about, but I'm not going to talk about it until right at the end. So, uh, for those of you who are aware of sort of the horse meat issue that happened uh, almost uh, 18 months ago, um, it was a bit, had a really big impact uh, within Europe. In fact, the horse meat <coughs> issue uh, initiated the largest food testing uh, program within Europe that's ever happened, and it was for a non-food safety problem, which is quite amazing. Uh, uh, it, so it's really changed the whole perspective uh, and it's changed the way both regulators and industry are going to have to address the problem. Uh, and one of the problems is, from a consumer's point of view, when they buy food, they just expect it to be what it says on the can. Uh, and one of the strange things is that if you buy food anywhere in Europe, you will never find something on the label which says the food is safe. Because it's effectively a fundamental right in the European uh, community that you provide safe food, so food is actually defined as safe when it's on the marketplace. It might not be, but effectively the consumer has a right to it. But you will find labels saying genuine, authentic, 100% pure. And therein lies the problem. Uh, that the consumer expects it to be what it says it is, whether that's a naive uh, sentiment or not, but that's the problem. Uh, and the new, there was a new uh, food information for consumers regulation which is going to be implemented uh, in the near future, uh, and that very much embraces this sentiment that if you 
say something on the label, then you should be able to, the consumer should expect it to be exactly what it says on the label. big horse meat problem. Um, industry, regulators, all the main sort of stakeholders were all a bit of, oh, to be honest, everyone was surprised about the issue because it actually it, it happened on a, on a relatively inexpensive processed product rather than the high value products that we always associate with, associate with sort of food authenticity issues. And what happened there was lots of people running around and they were trying to find expertise because it was very fragmented. There was nobody, there was no EFSA, there was no uh, real strong presence from, say, the Food Standards Agency or DEFRA in terms of this expertise. Uh, and everyone, all stakeholders, I think, were, were found sort of wanting. Methodologies, how do you measure some of this thing? There was a whole issue about how you measure horse meat. Well, actually, analytically, detecting horse meat is very, very easy. Um, we've got very good sort of DNA technology. But the next question was, I want to measure how much is there. That was a much difficult problem. There was a whole lot of discussions around Europe about how you actually measure how much is horse meat. We don't even have a common ontology. So if I talk to someone, a counterpart in the US, they have a completely different perspective. So if they talk about food adulteration, they're talking about a food fraud type activity which involves the food safety aspects. We don't have this, quite the same connotation over here. Everyone was looking for access to knowledge databases, intelligence, and information was not being shared. One of the questions about uh, that there was a lack of verification procedure, and I'll elaborate on this. Uh, an over-reliance on food traceability systems. Notice the quotation marks. Uh, a lack of harmonization of methodology and practice and very unclear specifications. This is the sort of the horse meat measurement aspect. So if we just look, you might have seen that picture when sort of the horse meat issue broke. It was sort of a, it was in the media. It's a media sort of view of how complicated the uh, system, the supply chain system was. Uh, actually, it's much more complicated than that. Uh, but that, the consumer, I think, was sort of surprised how complicated it was. Now, um, I coordinated a large project on sort of food traceability and all aspects of it. But at the start of that project, I had a very clear idea of what a food traceability system was. Five years later, like 20 million euros later, I wasn't so sure. And I would probably say we don't have food traceability systems, uh, which is quite a bold statement, I realise. But the reason is that if you look at, say, just a, say an ISO definition, there are quite a few definitions that people try to embrace when they're developing these systems. But it's the ability to follow the movement of a feed or food, those, those two, it's feed or food through specified stages of production, process and distribution. Um, and if you have a very sophisticated system, uh, you can have a, a traceability between enterprises and if you want a lot of granularity, sort of resolution, you can sort of make sure that they that actually property sheets relate to a, a low level of, uh, of, of uh, product. So you could do it to a pallet, for instance, or in some cases you could do it to a cargo, of, of a ship cargo. It's that sort of resolution which defines the quality of the um, And the EU and industry standards for traceability, uh, the EU ones are actually quite wide ranging. They basically says you have to do it one step up, one step down, which is basically I buy something, I need to know that bit, and I'm selling it on, I need to know that bit. But the 
something else. So the industry standards now are probably stronger than the EU standards for large industry. Um, but where, where we get to uh, SMEs is much less advanced. But anyway, that paints a sort of picture everything's okay. But all these systems, or I'd say 95% of them, they track and trace the food packaging. They don't verify the contents, of course. So if you look at the horse meat issue where you have uh, some fairly sophisticated systems tr tracking and tracing products, Actually, the contents weren't weren't beef burgers; they were horse burgers or mixtures of the drink. So you actually perpetuate the myth, and that's the fundamental problem. So that nowadays you hear much more accurate descriptions of supply chain management systems, which is what they are, and they have operate very well in that purpose. And they can track the packaging where it's been, the pallets, the cargoes, uh, the lorries, etc. But there needs to be a map between the verification, so between the contents and the identifier. And that's the key issue now, which has been uh, that Horse Weeks has brought to everyone's attention this recognition that somehow we have to do better in, in terms of verifying the contents uh, to the packaging. Now, there are some traceability systems, so we have a quite sophisticated beef traceability system post BSE. Uh, but the problem's there, when you've got good traceability up until slaughter, and that's when the problems start, if it gets put into various products. We don't have uh, a traceable tomato, but in theory we have a traceable egg. So we have the identifier on the egg. There, problems arise, we do have big problems with uh, egg fraud, and that's just where the sort of label, the wrong label is put on the wrong egg. Things to do with best before days. Right, so um, how do we verify things? Well, I'm an analytical chemist, so a lot of this is to do with analytical methodology. Uh, but basically, how, how we verify something is that we have some kind of limit or compliance limit. And that can either come directly from regulation or it come, can come from some kind of food standards. So that the food standards could come from, say, uh, NGOs like Codex. Um, but they could also be industry standards. So then we get a nice specification, and then we can just check whether it's compliant or not. It all sounds very nice. But half the time, if you're working in the food authenticity area, there aren't such nice specifications to measure, to measure for. So, as I said, if you're in the food safety area, there'll be lots of different uh, specifications for mycotoxins depending whether you're, uh, it's the end product or uh, in, in some, some part of the production. Alcoholic drinks is another good one. There's money involved, so it's no surprise that alcoholic drinks are the most highly regulated product there are. Uh, but even in terms of trade, you'll get codex standards for various uh, commodities. Food authenticity, can someone tell me what the specification is for geographical origin? Species variety, as I said, is, is difficult. Uh, can do it. Free range chicken, kind of, what's the specification for free range chicken? So, what happens in these, these sort of ideas is that we actually have to make the specification. Uh, and you see this uh, even in European regulations that actually we make pragmatic uh, specifications. A good example was the GMO. A regulation when that that was brought in saying originally I think it was 0.9% we had to measure and no one could at the time uh, and that drove sort of innovation to eventually meet that as soon as that was met they lowered the further. <laughs> uh, that's why when you people talk about food authenticity that they always talk about databases. Why do they need databases? It's because we haven't got a specification. So we make a specification the specification is what's normal. That's the typical product. So we have a database which describes that. Uh, and there's uncertainty in that database. And then we have to measure it. So then we get uh, experimental variation as well, the uncertainty in the methodology. So we have 
being uncertain. And when you go to court, the people that hate uncertainty are the lawyers. So that's why it's very difficult in this area. And people are looking for nice solutions, and they're not always there. So what all this means, and uh, industries that is on board with this, uh, is that what we need really to get sort of food integrity, which is this concept of safety, quality, authenticity, is that we need we need supply chain management or linked to risk management procedures sort of in the chain, and there has to be some kind of verification process somewhere along the line. And verification doesn't necessarily mean testing. Uh, it can be some kind of uh, improved type of auditing process whatever, but there has to be some kind of verification. And then you've got, uh, you can assure the integrity of your food chain. So the big question is how to do and how to do it efficiently. So if we look at the enforcement, uh, because whatever way we look at it, it's the enforcement agenda which, which will drive what, what industry has to comply with. So what, and you can also see that from what I said before, Enforcement bodies have a quite a big problem uh, anyway. So they need reliable methods, they need something, things which are validated, robust, with databases, they really like reference materials, and of course, even for enforcement, it needs to be cost effective. Uh, and it's going to be much more risk based approaches. And what all stakeholders want is horizon scanning uh, <coughs> tools which can anticipate where fraud is going to happen. So, for instance, uh, a drought in Oklahoma, what's the impact of that going to be on cereal prices in the future? How is that going to affect where potential risks could be? And what we really want, and this is what industry wants as well, is we want smart surveillance. And what that's probably going to mean is robust, untargeted methodologies. So, as I say, we're very much technology driven, so uh, I'm an analytical chemist uh, by training, and uh, if you go to a party and say you're an analytical chemist, well, you, you often sort of back to sort of where the drinks are <laughs> in the kitchen. Uh, but we don't get out much. Uh, and the reason for that is, if you came, to, you'd come to me with a problem, and you say, "Look, I've got this problem," and I'd say, "Well, what's what's the analyte?" And I'd, I'd define what the analyte is, and I'd develop a really nice method for your problem, uh, and measure it to the end. And that would be fine. But a week later, you'd come to me with another problem. And I'd have to develop another method to do that. And we'd go on and on like that. Very responsive. What's really exciting now is that we're, that we're at this time where we're sort of at almost like a revolution. And things are very going to change. What this means is we have lots of techniques for measuring change. And that's really what all the stakeholders want to know. They want to know if their product has changed. Now, traditionally, we've had techniques such as near-infrared, which were uh, sort of non-targeted techniques. So if you're, if you can do wheat nitrogen, for instance, by NIR, you just calibrate it against nitrogen content, and you've got a, a nice NIR method. It doesn't really tell you much about the information inside there. But it's, a, it's a, what we call a non-targeted method or a profiling method. But some of the big beasts down here, uh, down at this end of the NMR and mass spectrometry, you know, some of these really high-powered instruments can now work in a non-targeted way. What that means is that this, combined with some really fancy chemo, chemo informatics, is that you're a customer of mine, and I'm just measuring change in your product. And I bring you up there and say, look, something's changed. And maybe your factory in India or your uh, company in Peterborough or whatever, your factory there, it just changed. And because I'm using sophisticated instrumentation, I can even tell you what that change is due to. And that's really what's changing, what we mean by non-targeted methodology. Well, obviously, this is quite an expensive end, but we still want, for industry, they want that end. It doesn't have to be necessarily chemical methods, it may be physical methods have a role to play in this. And you can imagine industry wants some really cost-effective methods of measuring change. 
What's also happening in the molecular biology area is we've got the same thing. Next generation sequencing is providing us with non-targeted methodologies. Uh, people might think this is really sort of high in the sky and it's going to be very expensive. So this is a, a pyro sequencer which can sequence uh, human genomes in a couple of days, 20 years. That probably costs about 350,000 pounds. And then this, the next sort of uh, instrumentations are much quicker. We have those now, which is a high sig and my sig. What we have at the top there is a nanoscale device. We are testing this out in Ferra. And that's handheld, plugged into your, your laptop. And even now that costs 500 pounds. And that's just a process. What that means is you can, instead of doing a DNA test for your horse meat, you just do what's called metagenomics, you sequence the whole lot. And it's going to change, change the way that we do things, and it's going to be fast, and it's coming your way. Okay, probably a bit behind. Uh, the Food Integrity Project, which is to address all of these issues, so everything really I've said now, this project is aiming to address it. The European level. So it's 12 million euros. It's got uh, a wide membership, formally inside the project, so industry is very interested in this, uh, as are uh, government organisations. And then we have a whole range of actors and stakeholders who we want to be involved in the project. It's just been going, under, going on for about 10 months, and it's to provide Europe with a integrated capability for detecting food fraud and assure the food chain, because really what we want to do is not detect food fraud so much as prevent it from happening in the first place. To provide a, a sustainable body of expertise to make sure that people know where to come to, especially industry, uh, where there is real expertise. And it's also to uh, commission and advise on future research, look at the gaps. The key activities, as I said, is we're getting together a whole network of experts. We'll be producing scientific opinions uh, on the various uh, aspects of food authenticity. There isn't such a thing in Europe at the moment. There is obviously in the food safety area, but not on food authenticity. We're developing secure forums. In terms of the research which is going on, we're developing a, an early warning system and we're developing rapid methods for sort of industry type situations. Uh, and we have industry on board who are looking at all the things we do and see how they impact on industry, and probably more importantly how they've been exploited by industry. We're doing a consumer behaviour study in China. Uh, why are we doing that? It seems very strange. Well, there is real evidence that the mature middle classes in China, the well established middle classes in China are actually stopping to buy Western European products. Whereas the emerging middle classes are still buying them as fast as they can get them for some status symbols. Uh, the the, the well-established middle classes are starting to doubt them. The reason being, of course, is that so many of them are, are adulterated in their own country. It's a bit like going abroad and buying a Rolex watch. Do you really believe it's real? And that's happening. So there's some serious players in the food industry who are really worried about this, because this is almost what could happen to the sort of European agri-food economy if we're aiming to export high quality products uh, to developing countries. So there is a uh, food integrity network, so anyone who's got sort of expertise in this area can join, uh, and there's a sort of a proper formal database where we would you know, look at your expertise and you may well be contacted for other information, and this is the sort of um, database, what it looks like. Uh, we will also be producing a lot of uh, material for various stakeholders because there is, I say, a dearth of information. Uh, I get spoken, uh, run up by sort of media and press, uh, people about various issues, which I said actually that happened 10 years ago. It's not happening now. It's just they're so short of reliable information. Um, we're producing a whole knowledge base for the sort of the analytical people uh, about methods, 
databases, there's even going to be a database of databases. In other words, where can you go to get information on particular uh, commodities and, and problems? This is probably the sort of the biggest sort of research area we're doing is to develop a, an anticipatory system which will take into account um, high risks and then give you a sort of risk estimate of them. And what it's going to do is really exploit some of the technology which is available in the money markets, insurance industry, people who really need to know the future uh, and basically combine them and produce sort of a risk scenario. And we're going to use that on some existing models and then play it back into the system. So this will go on iteration. So there's a lot of people in, uh, interested in this uh, because everyone wants to know what's going to happen in the future. Right, near, near the end. Um, so we're also going to be commissioning three million euros worth of research, and that's happening. Uh, will be April next year. We'll actually be putting out calls, and none of the project participants are allowed to go for this money. So uh, we we don't have a vested interest in, in, in this, apart from <coughs> making sure it's successful. Whatever re research is commissioned, and then basically it's going to be in sort of four areas. I'm not saying that all of them are going to be actually funded, but that's what we're looking at. So analytical methodology, traceability issues, consumer issues, and industry uptake, this interface with industry. Um, these are some of the other stakeholders. This is very much out of date now, so we've probably got about 40, uh, mostly industry uh, in, uh, companies that uh, involved sort of on the periphery of the project. If you want to find out more, there's the website foodintegrity.eu. Uh, that's if you want email addresses if you want more information. Uh, so just to say that the Hallsmeet issue actually, although it's probably not so relevant now, has made a big sea change in the way that we look at these sort of issues. Uh, and the Food Integrity Project is, is sort of looking at this uh, at the moment, and for the, those who are interested in the research funding, uh, there is going to be a, a conference in Bilbao on the 26th and 27th, and, and we will be, as well as presenting some of the uh, research that I've just described, we will also be uh, presenting the calls that, for that 3 million euros, and we will also be looking uh, with uh, DG research and strategic requirements in this sector, and also bringing together all the national funding bodies involved in this type of funding, this type of work. So thanks very much to the Commission, to all my participants in the project, and thank you very much for your time.